I'd like to call to order the meeting of the Planning and Development Committee of Monday, May 8th at 6.05. Um, and Ms. Flax, if you take roll. Council Member Reed. Council Member Garcaris. Here. Council Member Rebell. Here. Council Member Burns. Council Member Wynn. Council Member Kelly. Here. Council Member Newsma. Here. We've got five present. Okay, and yeah. Okay. Just. I, just. Okay. Could, would somebody like to move um, the minutes? Approval of the minutes of our April twenty fourth, two thousand twenty three meeting. Okay. The minutes have been moved by Council Member Reed and seconded by Council Member Rafael. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Nobody opposed. I'll abstain. I was not here. I'm sorry. What is? It? I'll abstain. I was not here. But. Okay. And one abstention. Okay. Um, we'll now move to public comment, and we have in person. Is this right? Mm -hmm. In person, uh, first person is uh, Bernadette Burke. Hello, thank you. My name is Bernadette Burke, and I am the president of Brella Productions, located directly across from the proposed Fifth Ward School project. Brella has been in Evanston business for over 30 years, and we have been in the Fifth Ward for 17 years. While I support a Fifth Ward elementary school, I am here to formally oppose the current design and the required zoning variances of a building which requires four times the zone density of the property, removal of city parking, an increase in traffic congestion, and a negative impact on property values to those residents immediately adjacent to the project. <coughs> Excuse me. Currently in the city of Evanston, there are 10 K through five schools with an average student population of 300 to 400 students. For this project, the district is proposing a school to support 900 students, more than 2.5 times the city average in a congested neighborhood with many transportation challenges and with little concern to the neighborhood impact. The following are three of the primary issues and recommendations that would reduce or remove the need for major variances. Issue one, the floor area ratio or FAR of the District 65 lot is 0.15 uh, by zoned. Uh, the district is qu requesting a 0.26 FAR, which is in excess of other approved projects. If the district reduces the footprint of the school and only serves the K through five population, like the other 10 elementary schools in Evanston, it should meet the required zoning or at least have a smaller discrepancy. This reduction will serve the important role of educating the fifth ward students in their own neighborhood without creating a transportation nightmare. Issue two, this current zoning is 35 feet in height and the district 65 plan includes a solid wall of 45 to 55 foot brick along Simpson Street and a, a, a substantial one on Ashland. Um, by doing this, this will create a dark urban canyon, removing mature trees and filling the space with idling buses in what was previously an oak and green space. This is a negative for all businesses, visitors, and residents, as well as to future students. If the district would adjust its plan to a more typical K through five elementary school footprint, then the negative impact on the community would no longer be present. The last one is the Simpson uh, Street lay-by lane removes 20 vitally needed all-day parking spots for residents and the business community. For comparison, no other property owner in Evanston would typically be granted the use of an entire city block of street parking for their sole use. The business community is hemmed in by Green Bay and the Sanitary Canal, which severely limits on-street parking options to the north of Simpson Street. In the district's plan, this critical space on Simpson is not only needed for the five buses used for the Bessie Roads Magnet School, um, but if there is no magnet school, then there is need, no need for the variance. We, they can basically support the, the bus on their own property. In conclusion, the impact to the neighborhood of putting a huge butt building in a congested block while reducing on-street parking and increasing traffic congestion will have a disastrous impact on the residents and businesses in the community. I ask the planning community to rec reject this proposal and ask themselves, if this was a private organization with this kind of negative neighborhood impact, would you even consider approving this proposal? Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Next we have Mark uh, Malchuk. Yep. 
Hello, my name is Mark Melchok. I'm co-owner of 1601 and 1607 Simpson across from the proposed Fifth Ward School. I'm also speaking on the Fifth Ward School. I oppose the variances requested as well, and we'll focus in the limited time we have on the impact of the residents and businesses for parking around the proposed school. We've submitted a longer version with more details and data, but here's the short version. First, I would ask the Planning and Development Committee to require a new second neutral parking and traffic study before any approvals are granted. The KLOA transportation study was commissioned, and it has significant flaws with their assumptions and a limited data set of only one day. Not multiple days, one day. The neighborhood north of the property already has severe parking challenges for employees, customers, and area residents. On street cleaning, snow removal days, or when there are weekday funerals or wedding services, parking is very limited. I want to look at the parking availability that they provided from Wednesday, March 1st. The study claimed an optimistic average of 60% availability or 250 spots. Using similar methods to KLOA, our staff counted the spaces and cars at 9 a.m. on April 19th, the date of the Land Use Commission meeting, as well as this very morning. For Simpson, they listed 57% available. We calculated 49% on April 19th and only 24% available today. On Ashland, they calculated 40% available. We calculated the same on the 19th, but as of today, only 30%, 37% available. They also did not include Ashland from Payne to Noise, which is a primary street for parking. There are 19 spots in existence. Only two were available on either of those days. If we include these spots, it reduces the average to 30% available for all of Ashland. We also counted the parking lot and Noise in Ashland as well as parking on Dewey and Payne. The available parking for the entire area was only 23%. If we allow, as is proposed, the removal of parking from the south side of Simpson and on Ashland between Foster and Simpson, the removal of these 50 spots for the use of this one business reduces the local parking availability to only 4%. This also does not include the 20 to 30 extra staff parking not accounted for in the 83 spots in their lot, 75 are staff, minus 25 for Fleetwood Jordan, five for visitors, five for handicapped parking, and five for EV parking. Family Focus is proposed as an option for these spots, but they only had 16 spots available today. For parent parking, KLOA has contradictory numbers. They estimate needing only 100 parking spaces, but in other, they indicate 214. The report estimates only 35% of students being dropped off. This seems highly optimistic. I cannot believe that parents between Church Street and Emerson will be walking their kindergartner or first, grade, first grader all the way to school on rainy or snowy days. These parents and many others will drive their kids to school and as stated in the documents, park on the neighborhood streets to escort or pick up young children for the school. Please do not let this project move forward until these significant issues have been addressed. I ask the committee to make the applicants perform another more specific study over multiple days, and until that time, vote against any variations that allow the applicant to move forward with their proposal. We should treat this application like any other homeowner or business and make them responsible for additional parking and traffic due to the challenges for the residents and the businesses in the area, as well as the city of Evanston. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And online we have Ms. Rosalie Regal. Ms. Regal, Rosalie Regal, are you here? Okay, okay. Is, is that it? Okay, that concludes public comment for this evening. Uh, we'll now move to um, the first item on our agenda. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, please do. Yeah, apologies, I'm sorry, we didn't see your name. Okay, uh, in fact, the person who signed me up was Maria. I decided I needed to jot that down just so you know this was legitimate. Uh, my name is Dr. Beverly Reed. I am a retired educator. Uh, I'm here to discuss housing, namely Ebenezer Prim Towers, uh, senior apartments located at Emerson and Maple Ward 5, Evanston, Illinois. More specifically, the total rehabilitation of the building, 
which is in progress for approximately 18 months or longer. Uh, by the way, I'm entitling this sustainability and seniors. On the surface, that would appear to be a good thing, but I'm here to discuss what is going on beneath the surface, noise, dust, and sustainability issues affecting seniors. My coming here may represent courage or stupidity. I realize that what I'm about to say may garner me reprisal or retaliation, but sometimes you have to speak up anyway. I have resided there for 10 years. I've seen great and not so great. Uh, while the re renovation may be legal, I'm asking, is it ethical? Is it moral? Is it conscionable? Is it respectful? Is it healthy? And is it responsible to people who are at least 62 years old, but maybe 95 years old, older and poor? I felt compelled to come here due to another event that happened uh, at Ebenezer Prim Tower before the rehab. I had been without a working stove for two years until April 2023. Uh, the management knew during their own inspection they discovered this. For two years, I asked the manager six times to replace my non-working oven. The first two requests were ignored. The last four requests, I was promised a working stove, but it did not happen. Finally, in desperation, I called Evanston's 311 number and they sent a city inspector whose name I won't call, but I'll call her privately if I'm asked. Uh, she found that I had told the truth. And so I was hurriedly, rather than given a new stove, I was hurriedly rushed into uh, a rehab unit. Uh, there were two meetings to inform tenants of what was to happen. Were our leases, I asked, were our leases breached because there was no clause stating that we could be moved for the rehab? Our leases stated that management could enter into our units to make repairs only. I was moved on April 4, 2023. On April 13, 2023, the management received a letter from my doctor stating the impact of this move on my health with a recommendation going forward. The management totally disregarded and dismissed uh, my doctor's request. On April 5th, one day after the move, I had to call the fire department to move boxes so I could get to my medicine. I informed them that this call was non-emergency, but it would become an emergency if I did not receive my medicine. The manager, in fact, had ordered all my boxes pushed together uh, instead of space left between each one of them as the developer who was uh, responsible for the project had recommended. So they were too heavy and tall, which I could not get to the box that had my medicine, although I could see it as I had, as I had it labeled. Going back to April 4th, the movers put all my six bags of fresh food in, uh, in whole food bags and boxes and sealed them and stacked them after I had asked them three times not to do that. I had to beg the developer to open every box so I could locate the food so it would not spoil, become rancid, and ruin everything in the box. Uh-oh. Is my time up? Um, it is up. I do thank you, um, and I, somebody will certainly follow up with you Please on these do. concerns. Please do, because yeah. I didn't get to the specificity of the sustainability issues that are presenting a legal challenge to what's going on in the building. It's very serious. Yeah, thank you very much for coming you forward can, and speaking to that. Just thank as you. a note, you can present your written comments to staff. Uh, maybe in this moment, maybe Ms. Williams, if you want to just take it and then we'll. Okay, nobody else has signed up. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak before we move forward with the agenda? Okay, all right, with that, um, would somebody like to move the first item um, on our agenda item? I will you move. Oh, go ahead. I'll, I'll be happy to move item P1, which is ordinance 33-0-23, special use for an apartment hotel in the R6 district at 1555 Oak Avenue. Uh, this is known as the Museum Residences on Oak, formerly the King Home. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Good evening, uh, So I understand we have a short presentation from the applicant and then some discussion. Terrific. Welcome. Thank you so very much. Uh, my name is Alan Didish. I'm a house counsel for BCH 1555 LLC, which is the applicant here this evening. And with me is Camille Halim, who is the building manager, uh, the manager of the LLC that owns the property. Um, this is our third appearance before the uh, Planning and Development Committee. 
and uh, we're here to respectfully request that a decision be made one way or the other tonight, either approve it, approve it with conditions, or outright reject it. Uh, Mr. Helene, did you have some comments you wanted to address? Not really. <laughs> uh, I just want to say something about, I have built that museum on Oak Street, I think maybe eight years ago. And after the success of the museum, we had planned to acquire more property around the museum and try to extend downtown toward this area because it had uh, it had the, the museum, it had the king towards the YMCA, and it has other cultural facilities there. So first thing we purchased the land, which 1555 Oak, which extend from Oak all the way to Maple. And it has two lots. It has R6, which is the museum in, and then it have a D4 uh, uh, lot, which toward Maple, which was sometime we want to develop it. And then we acquired the, the Boti Studio, which we want to build something in it here. And then we acquired the building at 960 Grove, which is a building, office building was always in trouble in Evanston. We're rehabbing it now, and we have, we can make it a nice office building. So the, the, the hotel is part of a plan which we thought that would be good to improve the whole area there. Uh, we, I think we had a meeting last time here, and uh, most of the council members, they uh, had some concern, and uh, Alderman Guzma, he uh, had a, a, a neighborhood meeting, which had maybe about 100 people, and there was a great support for the uh, hotel in the uh, meeting. And some of them have some concern. I think the alderman did a good job. We met him with him once after the meeting, and we met twice in the city. And I think we have reached some points that we agreed to, and he is going to submit it to you. We have some concern of one or two points, but most of the condition. I think it's very good for us and go, very, very good for the city. And maybe if we want to discuss these points so you get familiar. I think a, a copy went to every one of you. And uh, first thing, we can answer any questions or have any concern. And then we will, we, I can see my concern of the point we have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Newsma. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, this I, I ask for this to be uh, held uh, at our last meeting of planning and, and development to allow us to have time uh, to have that community meeting. Uh, so we did that. Uh, thank you for hosting us at the uh, at the King Home. Uh, it's a beautiful property. We had that com that meeting on April 29th. Uh, by my count, there were 60-some, maybe not quite 100, but I am in full agreement that there was you know, pretty broad and strong support for operating essentially a hotel in that location. Um, and the reason we're having this discussion is because uh, this is an R6 zone. R6 does not allow hotels. R6 does allow apartment hotels. Our code uh, is not super clean on this point, but apartment hotel, according to our code, uh, only requires a minimum of 25% short-term guests. Uh, it could have 99 or 100% short-term guests, which kind of sounds like a hotel to me. And I wasn't comfortable moving this forward until I had some assurance uh, that the neighborhood was comfortable with an operation like this. So as a result of this discussion at the, uh, at the neighborhood meeting, I now have that comfort that I need to, um, to move this forward. And there was another question uh, that kind of related to the management of a hotel. Uh, since uh, Mr. Halim and his organization have extensive experience managing rental properties and uh, and operating in you know in the hospitality industry in terms of food service uh, at the museum, but a hotel is something new, and um, we had originally discussed you know, requiring a third-party management company. 
Uh, however, as the discussions have evolved over the last few weeks, uh, it's become clear that the relationship with Wyndham uh, will provide the oversight and the guidance that I need to make me comfortable that the hotel is being operated at the highest level of, of professionalism. Um, so those are kind of the two main sticking points, and uh, I would like to now refer to the hard copy that uh, was just passed out recently, uh, and um, uh, Sarah Flax emailed it a few minutes ago as well, but uh, I would like uh, to offer as um, an amendment to the ordinance uh, that we adopt the following conditions. Uh, I'm not sure we need to read through all of them one by one. Happy to do that. Uh, these are not in the packet, which is why I'm making this, uh, this motion on the floor. I'll second. I just think for the public that you may want to go over these okay. briefly. Uh, so I will, uh, I will paraphrase uh, in the interest of time, but condition number one uh, requires the applicant to uh, pave the parking lot in accordance with our stormwater management ordinance, allowing them a little bit of flexibility if they have uh, a plan to uh, do something different with that property. Uh, Number two uh, requires the applicant to substantially comply with the documents and testimony given by the applicant uh, on the record in previous, uh, in previous hearings. Uh, number three, the applicant shall record the special use permit with the Cook County Recorder of Deeds. Number four, a shared housing license must be obtained uh, pursuant to city code. Number five, the applicant shall make all updates to the property that are required by the Hotel Flags Property Improvement Plan uh, dated March 22nd uh, and any amendments thereto. This is uh, Wyndham we're talking about here. And this requirement obligates uh, the applicant to follow Wyndham's guidelines. Uh, as does uh, number six, the applicant shall maintain a valid hotel flag. That means maintain the relationship with Wyndham or if there is no uh, affiliation uh, with Wyndham, the applicant shall contract with a third party management company specializing in hotel management to operate the facility. So as long as you continue to work with Wyndham, uh, you, you would not have to, the applicant would not have to hire a third party management. Can I just one question. With regard to number um, six, so Wyndham does specialize in apartment hotels, correct? Wyndham uh, is a, an umbrella brand that has a, a bunch of different kind of brands that operate under the Wyndham family. Wyndham will be promoting this and marketing this as a Hawthorne property. Hawthorne is an extended stay brand. An extended stay apartment hotel. So for number six, do we want to say specializing in apartment hotel management? Or I mean... I, I'm comfortable I mean, with the wording that we have here. Okay. Um, so number seven uh, just restates the requirement that uh, the applicant will comply with the hotel tax payments pursuant to city code. They would be obligated to do that anyway, even, this, even if this condition were not uh, in the special use agreement. Uh, number eight, uh, the garden and patio shall remain as open green spaces unless uh, changes are proposed and approved in compliance with city codes. That allows the applicant some flexibility. If Wyndham requires some reconfiguration or you want to do something a little bit different with the restaurant, uh, in any case, you would have to come back to the city for the appropriate level of approval. What that level of approval is depends on what exactly you would be requesting. Uh, number nine gets into signage. Uh, exterior lighting and signage shall be in keeping with the residential character of the R6 neighborhood. Uh, and does require a separate uh, permit approval process. Uh, the applicant uh, shall have the right to apply for a variance to current lighting and signage requirements. Allows some flexibility, but also indicates that the applicant acknowledges that this property is in an R6 primarily residential zone, and we will work collaboratively to make sure that we're using signs that are not, you know, shining the light right into somebody's bedroom across the street. Uh, number 10, the applicant agrees to consider installing rooftop solar uh, 
a rooftop solar system, it'll be in their uh, sole discretion whether or not to do that. So thank you for considering that. You've demonstrated uh, a commitment to energy efficiency with some of the uh, improvements you've already made to the building. And I'd love to be able to, uh, to do this one as well. But of course, you're not obligated to do anything other than think about it. Uh, number 11 uh, gets into workforce development. Uh, the applicant agrees to work collaboratively with the city's economic development division, the city's workforce development division, division uh, ETHS high school, and other local partners to identify, hire, and train Evanston residents. And ultimately, it's the applicant's sole discretion as to whom they hire. The city's not putting any money into this project, uh, but uh, we are asking them to work collaboratively with our workforce de development folks, and you know, by accepting uh, this condition, uh, they are acknowledging the, the intent to do so. We can correct that, and you can put some money, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I guess I've made a motion to accept these um, uh, to accept these uh, these conditions as an amendment to the ordinance. Second. I think Councilmember Wynn seconded. So we'll go ahead and vote then on this amendment to the ordinance. And Ms. Flax, if you would call. call. Councilmember Reed? Aye. Councilmember Hargaris? Aye. Councilmember Ravel? Aye. Councilmember Wynn? Aye. Councilmember Kelly? Aye. Councilmember Newsma? Aye. Okay, that the amendment passes, and Council Member Reed. We already voted on it. I'm sorry. We already voted on it. It's fine. Okay. Okay, so now we that brings us to the underlying motion uh, of Ordinance 33-0-23 as amended. Uh, that motion is on the table. Um, Any further discussion? Okay. So take the roll. Uh, Council Member Harakaris? Aye. Council Member Reed? Aye. Council Member Ravel? Aye. Council Member Kelly? Aye. Council Member Newsma? Aye. And Council Member Wynn? Aye. Thank you very Thank much. You. Okay, Appreciate it. We now move to item P2. Would somebody like to move item P2? I will move item P2, ordinance 46023, granting a special use for a cannabis dispensary and a special use for a type two restaurant in the B3 district at 100 Chicago Avenue. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Discussion? We have, uh, I think we have the, the owners here and if All right. you have a brief presentation or anything you want to share. Uh, we, we have prepared. Uh, Ashley Brandt from Tucker Ellis on behalf of the applicant. I have with me Amaya Puar, the general manager of the applicant. I know we submitted our, our application. I know you have the packet. I know there's a lot behind us tonight. Um, we did have a PowerPoint. I don't want to belabor the issue. If if there are, um, if there are Please, any questions free to that you have. Please take a or, couple of minutes to walk through it. Good evening, uh, I'm Matt Pawar. I'm one of the principal officers of uh, OK Cannabis and West Town Bakery. Um, the proposal that you have before you is um, we're hoping to go in at 100 Chicago Avenue and open a uh, traditional cannabis dispensary, but also with an attached bakery bar and restaurant that's attached. And what they will have separate entrances. What's unique about this is that in most uh, dispensaries that you see around the state, they are very transactional experiences. You walk in, you wait in line, you purchase the product, and you leave. Um, what we're really hoping to do with OK uh, Cannabis and West Town Bakery is sort of normalize the experience so that you know there's nothing wrong with cannabis. It, you can come in and purchase cannabis if you'd like, but you can also come in and grab uh, a dark matter coffee, buy a pastry, sit down and have a meal. Um, and spend some time there. So it's a traditional coffee shop. It's on the bakery side. Nothing is infused. It's as if you go, go to any West Town Bakery location in the city of Chicago. Um, but then, of course, in the uh, dispensary, it is, that is where you would buy cannabis. Both um, concepts are under one roof. Both um, are separate um, operations. But um, what makes them unique is that this, is, we would, this would be the second such operation in the state of Illinois. 
and likely the second such operation in the United States. Um, our ownership team is uh, social equity. 93% of our ownership is black and brown. 51% uh, of our ownership is uh, social equity and veteran owned. Uh, Charles Mayfield is our uh, social equity owner. He's a United States Air Force veteran, um, African American, and a longtime public servant in the city of Chicago. Uh, our restaurant um, and bakery operator is the 5050 Restaurant Group, which is based out of the city of Chicago. Um, they own and operate 20 establishments. Some of the names include the Kindling, which just opened in the Willis Tower uh, with the James Beard award-winning chef. They uh, manage Second City, um, Roots Pizza, among other establishments. So um, we're excited to be uh, considered. We're excited to hopefully open in Evanston. And also one of the reasons we uh, sought this location out is that it is on the Evanston side. and our sales tax, we know, contributes to the reparations fund, and so we um, made an active effort to be on that side of Howard. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, with, are there more PowerPoint slides? that uh, We, have, we yeah. have various PowerPoint slides to walk you through the dispensary to show you the, the flow diagram, uh, show you the, the layout, uh, show you the Show you the, the, the bike racks. Uh, and maybe just a little bit how the bakery um, adjoins, just to get a better idea. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, if someone enters the bakery, they would you know just go to the coffee shop, order something, have a seat. Within the um, and maybe, do you want to know what the different colors represent? I don't okay. know if we can see it from here. So the purple is what the so, green is what yellow is what got it so the yellow section is the the bakery um, and restaurant area the green is the dispensary the purple is restricted access so that is where the vault um, and other uh, the destruction area for cannabis um, our IT room and the cameras and the security is um, in the yellow section that you see over there that is where you would enter into the doors over there uh, up on the top right is where you'd enter into the to the bakery and uh, restaurant um, and then there's a vestibule if you look at that top corner with the blue um, if you wanted to go inside of the dispensary you would have to have your ID checked in that little vestibule and then you would enter only uh, individuals that are 21 and over can enter the dispensary um, but as our location in Wheeling that's currently open what we are saying is we have a lot of families and people coming in and uh, stopping in to buy a cake ball or a cake for a birthday party or buy a cup of coffee. So you can be under 21, you just can't be unaccompanied um, in the bakery side. But in order to enter the dispensary, you have to be 21 and over and to be through that little blue vest fuel area right there. Um, there will be security uh, stationed throughout the dispensary and in the bakery and outside. There will be a, a marked vehicle in the parking lot at all times. The, the uh, lot is not big enough where we would have a car patrolling, but you would have a, uh, someone from the security team walking the perimeter um, throughout the day. Great, thank you. Um, Council Member Reed? Yes, thank you. Um, so I uh, am really excited about this project. Uh, I had the opportunity to go visit the Wheeling location, uh, and I think it's a beautiful location. This is obviously, or not obviously, I don't know if folks have, but it's a sm this is a smaller location um, uh, than the Wheeling location. It's in a, a mixed-use development where that is standalone, uh, but I think the uh, general design will work out really well here. I, I think this will hopefully become the most popular dispensary uh, in, in Evanston, and we'll have that on the south end. Um, I can tell you what I think is great about the experience here is it's a really user-friendly experience when compared to other dispensaries, particularly in Illinois. And so I think they'll have great success here. I think the community is really excited. We had Amaya join us at our last ward meeting. And you know, while there are some questions about security, I think folks are really, really excited to see this. and and hoping to uh, you know, maybe even see some of the hours adjusted down the road
to allow for them to open a bit earlier because uh, many folks said that they'd like to stop by uh, the bakery and dispensary maybe 7 o'clock in the morning as they're heading uh, to catch the train into downtown. Uh, so um, looking forward to uh, this passing and uh, answering any questions that my colleagues have. Thank you. Councilmember Ravel. Uh, I just had a question. So in order to get into the dispensary, you have to enter through the bakery? Yes. Uh, again, you would be entering through the bakery, and if you choose to go into the dispensary, there is a vestibule again at that top. There will be someone stationed there at all times. Your ID will be scanned. Right. There will be a camera um, mm -hmm. that will capture the image, and you'll be verified before you can walk in. But again, only individuals that are 21 and over right. can right. enter the dispensary. No, I, I'm just um, so, and but you can exit directly from the dispensary, or yes. So you can you, you must you must enter the dispensary through the bakery, but you can leave the dispensary either way. Uh, no, no uh, we wouldn't have an exit. You wouldn't be able to go back in to uh, the, oh, you, the bakery. You, I mean, you can walk around, uh, but you couldn't just go back and forth. P part of that is, is mm -hmm. one, from a security standpoint, two, uh, there's no on-site consumption. That's right, 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 yeah. Okay, it, it just, I don't know, I guess I would think it would improve business if people could just enter the dispensary directly from the outside, but no. I, I, this way you build business for your bakery, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to answer your question, uh, Council Member, we think uh, bringing people through the bakery also just changes the experience. Um, and hopefully, you know, if you choose not to go into the dispensary, we still want you coming in. We have our own dark matter coffee uh, that we will be serving, so we'd want you to enjoy that as well. Thank you. Council Member Nusma. Thank you, Madam Chair. So this will be our second dis dispensary in Evanston. Is, is that it, or are the what are what's our maximum number? If if staff or someone or even uh, I'll trust Council Member Reed on this. My memory uh, is uh, I remember the number three floating around back when we started this. Yeah, I know certainly that was at least a goal. I don't know if that was the absolute cap. Um, but I, I do think somewhere around three. Okay. okay. Yeah. But we didn't the, discuss. The we city didn't manager have is a... nodding in the affirmative. So I don't think okay. you actually have a cap. Okay. Right. I don't think we do. Anyway, anyway, this doesn't get us close to a cap, even if we did have one. No. So okay. I'll Thank I'll you. Do my best to bring one. Yeah. Councilmember Reed. Yes, and. Uh, uh, just uh, in response to Councilmember Ravel's uh, question, I, I visited the um, Wheeling location, uh, and it was a, the similar setup where you had to walk through not the bakery exactly, but this uh, kind of uh, vestibule area, and you you only go out one way. And uh, <laughs> uh, it, I, I wish you could have gone back into the bakery, but uh, you can only go out one way. And I just lastly want to note, uh, since the applicants didn't, uh, just the strong Evanston connections that they have. I think Mayor at one point worked at Northwestern. Uh, family is from uh, Evanston, married family. I think we have a seventh warder who is one of the. Uh, oh, oh, Councilmember Ravel is my elder. Oh, Councilmember Ravel, <laughs> yeah. So uh, the team is, is connected to uh, Evanston, and so really excited that. Uh, and I think that's really what drew them here, having that deep connection, Evanston, understanding. Uh, our reparations program and our commitment to it uh, is, is exactly what drew, drew this applicant here. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, with that, um, Ms. Flex. Councilmember Caracaras? Aye. Councilmember Reed? Aye. Councilmember Rappel? Aye. Councilmember Kelly? Aye. Councilmember Nusma? Aye. And Councilmember Wynn? Six to zero in favor. Six six that passes. This will go to council. Great. Okay, we now move to item P three. If someone would please move item P three. I will move item P three, ordinance forty eight zero twenty three, granting major variations for a K through eight education institute, public on property located at two thousand Simpson Street in the OS open space district. Second. 
Okay, item P3 has been moved and seconded. Discussion. Do we have a presentation? Oh, presentation. We do have a presentation. Good evening. I'm Brian Cronwitter with Cordigan Clark representing D65. Is there an advancer for this? Thank you. I have a short presentation, Raphael. Hi, I'm Raphael Obafemi from D65. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for the district. Great. We're here to address a really small presentation here, um, sort of the five variations uh, primarily. I'm going to walk through uh, some site design components and then uh, give you a flavor for the uh, exterior of the building and some real quick snapshots of the interior. Uh, as some of you may or may not be aware of the, the site, you can see we call it the uh, Foster Field Campus, uh, family focus being up to the upper part of the, the, the diagram here. North is to the right, south is to the left. So to the west is family focus. We have the City of Evanston property, which is currently the Fleetwood Jordan Community Center. And then in the green with the blue uh, building, that is the D65 property. Uh, part of the, uh, the variations, two of them are really, really idiosyncrasies of the site being two front uh, yards. One being Foster Street, you can see a small uh, opening or uh, element of Foster is part of the parking lot. That is one of the variations uh, that's causing two of the variations actually. Uh, or in, and the other uh, front yard is, is Simpson Street. So we want to quickly walk through the next slide here. Actually uh, talk a little bit about the KLOA uh, transportation study. We have representatives from KLA here for any questions you may have. Pretty in-depth study if you had a chance to peruse it. It's about 175 pages. Um, looked into the entire uh, Fifth Ward traffic patterns, uh, looking at crosswalks, and so on and so forth. Uh, based on planning and zoning, we did make an update to the site plan to address some of the concerns with planning and zoning as well as staff. I know it's difficult to read this diagram, but we really, the primary change has been to the Ashland front. This really depicts it uh, better here. We included an additional, we call it a lay-by lane or a parent drop-off lane along Ashland, which was a recommendation to, to handle any additional vehicles from a parent drop-off that might uh, need, need to uh, uh, drop their student off along Ashland. That in, 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 in doing that, that pretty much widens out Ashland to a 34 foot, which was a recommendation by planning and zoning. The Simpson Street side, the south side of Simpson Street will be the bus drop off for the relatively few number of buses that will be utilized for this walkable school. Uh, you can see uh, the building, it really uh, aligns along Simpson as well as Ashland. It is a three story building most of the height of that building is at 45 feet with a couple of large, uh, taller areas for a uh, center entry atrium, kind of that uh, knuckle of the building, which is, gets up to 55, but primarily it is a 45 foot high building. Um, the play field, which was along Simpson, has been moved to the back side of the new building. Uh, it's still large enough to have um, practice for football, um, some soccer. It's not regulation for either, but it gives the opportunity for, for PE and, and other uh, recreational events to happen, not only for the school, but for the neighborhood. We are also including a parking lot, which will be shared with the city of Evanston, the Fleetwood Jordan building. There'll be 25 spaces dedicated for that uh, function of the community center, and then the rest will be for parking for staff and visitors to the school. Uh, you can see Dewey Avenue is still, will re retain its current shape. We're really not messing with Dewey at all. We are going to be adding a basketball court, which has been displaced due to the addition of the new parking lot that was over in that section between Foster and Ashland. And then in including an additional playground will be shared with family focus. So that is the site plan. I'm going to give to you some slides kind of depicting the character, architectural character of the building. 
This is the kind of the bird's eye view of Simpson and Ashland. You can see a relatively um, mostly masonry building, brick veneer, a couple of colors of brick veneer, some accent banding with a metal panel at the upper part of the building. This is the back view, another bird's eye looking, uh, hovering over family focus, looking at the recreation field in the back of the building. This is a street level shot uh, along Simpson, uh, kind of looking at the main entry to the building. Again, like I said, it's about 45 feet to the parapet with a higher version in that center being about 55 feet. And then this is the view from Ashland. We step this uh, elevation back to be um, sympathetic to the residences on that side, trying to break the scale down of the building. So there's a couple setbacks along this elevation. And then another uh, uh, pedestrian view of the field looking over the field to the back of the building. And a shot on Dewey looking at the building. Then a night shot from the recreation field looking at the building. I'm going to quickly walk you through very uh, early preliminary uh, floor plans of the building, mostly classroom wing along the uh, Simpson Avenue side with the entryways, some administrative in the pink, uh, a commons cafeteria and some band as well as food service to the south. Second floor, again, classroom wing uh, along Foster, I mean, excuse me, along Simpson, student services at the Knuckle, and then the gymnasium and some upper level sections of the cafeteria to the south as well as locker rooms. And then the third floor, again, classroom wing along Simpson, student services in the Knuckle, and then some mechanical and, and additional spaces to the south. That is the presentation. Happy to take any questions you may have. Councilmember Reed. Yes, uh, thank you. One, uh, thank you. I'm excited about this. I represent the eighth ward, but I grew up in the fifth ward. Uh, and it would have been nice to be able to walk to school as opposed to uh, wait out in the cold uh, to go to Orrington, which was a wonderful experience uh, at Orrington. Um, I, I do have a few questions that I heard from public comment. So I, I heard a uh, public commenter mention a, uh, you know, a, a brick wall facing one of the streets. I didn't see that in that design. So can you res respond to that? And I'm sympathetic with that. I think the city made a mistake with uh, Robert Crown and we have a big brick wall uh, uh, on one side. Uh, so happy to address that. As you saw the elevation from Simpson Street, a lot of fenestration windows along that that uh, that street front. Ashland was the step back elevation again, not a blank brick wall. There really aren't any blank brick walls uh, exposed to the residential to the street side. Thank you. Uh, can you address uh, you address the FAR question? Uh, this is for the the district, and I don't know if you're the. But does this school have, uh, will, is it planned that the school have 900 students and is it accurate that other schools are? Uh, yes, the, the projection here, most of us, actually all of our school except for this one, are normally K through six, and then we have middle school. But in this particular case, the plan is to have it be uh, K through eight, mm -hmm. which is why we have more students there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and then this is uh, maybe for our own staff, but uh, there is a, a mention of uh, the average availability of parking being, you know, uh, depending on one calculation, 37 percent, another calculation, 30 percent. Um, my understanding is that particularly when you're looking at demand-based pricing and utilizing the infrastructure, parking infrastructure, you'd really optimally like to have uh, 15 percent vacancies um, for, for, for people to utilize. And so, you know, I don't know if there's if if there's any parking staff here, Mike or Lucas, that want to correct me on that. Uh, but given that understanding, 
um, you know, I'm comfortable. I hear the concerns of folks who are, who are raising uh, those, but I, I think they uh, uh, may not uh, fit here. Uh, with that, uh, excited that we're hopefully going to move forward with this tonight. Uh, looking forward to hearing more from my colleagues. Uh, Council Member Nusma. Thank you, Madam Chair. Looking forward to getting a, a Fifth Ward school built one way or the other as soon as we can. I think this is uh, long overdue and been sorely missed in the Fifth Ward. Um, 900 students is a lot for that small parcel of land, uh, it, not to mention the traffic and logistics of getting all those kids to school. So do we have any idea how many kids are expected to actually walk to school, how many will be dropped off, how many are coming in buses? The, uh, the plan is to have the vast majority of the kids actually walk to school. As it stands right now, we have uh, about 600 kids who actually get transported all over the district, mm -hmm. mainly in the northern part of the district. Now, most of these kids actually come from the fifth ward. And the goal is to have those kids have the same privilege that other kids who have neighborhood school enjoy, which is to be able to get up at a decent time and to be able to walk with a family member to school instead of the practice that we have right now where they have to get up super early, stand on the corner, and some of those kids have to ride the bus for about an hour going from one side of the city to the other side of the city to be able to get to school. So with the numbers that we have right now, we easily have about 800 kids who will be able to actually live in the, uh, in the ward and be able to walk to school. Right. Walking distance doesn't mean those kids are automatically going to walk. Case in point, my two children who uh, get driven to school more often than their mom or dad would, uh, would prefer. So you know, I, I think you are anticipating that some kids will get dropped off even though they are perfectly capable of getting themselves up out of bed, having breakfast, and getting to school. That's true. That's true. I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with you on that. But I think I, I totally agree with you. What I want to add is currently we provide transportation, and we know some of our, some of our parents use that as babysitting, right? So the kids get to get out early and they get to, to, to ride buses. With the plan in this school, the goal is for kids to be able to, to walk to, to school. And as I'm you know, driving around in the city, in this city, because I used to oversee transportation until this year, and I will say a chunk of our kids actually walk to school. I see parents walking their kids to school and, and having the crossing guard help them cross the across the streets as they go to school. Since we will not be providing transportation the way we used to, the goal is to have them be part of a walkable school. You are absolutely right uh, that some of them will have to be driven to school, but we are hoping that uh, most parents would just want the time to be able to walk to school with their kids. Thank you. It, it, it's very difficult to predict that with any accuracy. It depends on weather, right. mostly. Say. Thank you. Councilmember Ravel. Uh, so uh, one thing that you've not mentioned is um, the one thing really contributing to the size of the school is the fact that it's also accommodating the Bessie Rhodes school yes. kids. And um, so I'm, I'm wondering, did the district ever consider um, moving just Bessie Rhodes, for example, to the King Arts School, where apparently there's quite a bit of excess capacity? We, we did consider that. The, uh, the complicating factor with that is we'll still have to provide transportation. And the way we have funded this school is to use the savings from transportation to be able to pay for the uh, lease certificate. And so if we shift those kids who currently go to Bessarels who are residents of the Fifth Ward to King Arts, it doesn't really accomplish the goal of creating a walkable school for the kids who live in the fifth ward. Right, um, but we're also doing a lot to accommodate um, buses and parents dropping their kids off. I'm, I'm also, so in addition to the size, I'm gonna vote yes because I think the fifth ward neighborhood school is a really important goal, um, but I do have to register my concern about the size and uh, the you know, a school population of 900 kids or whatever. Um, it, and, and given that the 
the district seems to be projecting a continued um, decline in enrollment. So I, I, that's a concern. And then, and then if, if we are going to have these two um, lay-by bays or whatever they're called on Ashland, um, that's going to require the removal of, um, I guess, 15 mature trees on Ashland. So that's a concern to me as well. So I guess I'm wondering, do you really need to have those lay-by bays? Well, I think city staff uh, rightfully recommended at least two um, based on the potential parent drop-off volume that might uh, happen with this building. Yeah. I mean, most other schools don't have those kind of lay-by drop-off areas. They manage to, parents manage to park a block or two away and walk their kids over. That is true, but it's also one of the pain points that we actually have in the district right now. When a lot of our schools were developed, cars were not as prominent as they are right now. And some of the schools um, are located in a very narrow street. Oak, uh, Oakton comes to mind. Dewey comes to mind. Orrington comes to mind. And Willard, for example, comes to mind, too. And we've had to do a cop car because of the, uh, of the fact that the streets are just so narrow that it creates a safety issue. So, yes, to the point that uh, our, our existing schools don't have that, but since we are building a new school, I will recognize that folks drive car more than the, the older schools. I mean, some of our schools were built in 1911. Then the older schools, we thought it made sense to, to build that into the design of the school. Yeah, if, but if we provide more opportunities for parents to drive their kids and drop them off, it's going to discourage the kids from walking and biking. I, I think it's unfortunate. You're absolutely right. I think we have to try to balance it out. Yeah. Thank you. Councilmember Reed. Uh, I, I, too, will just lodge uh, my support for what Councilmember Ravel is saying. I, I'm certainly going to vote yes, but it would be great uh, to see the district, uh, you know, uh, essentially partner with the city in meeting our CARP goals and, uh, and, and encouraging folks to, uh, we know that the Fifth Ward has the highest rates of, uh, you know, many illnesses, diabetes, heart disease. Um, and so if we build infrastructure that encourages folks to utilize cars, which are not healthy for them when they could be walking or biking to school, um, I, th I think we are doing a disservice for that community in the long run. And uh, I, if, if there is a way, and maybe it saves you all money, that uh, you can get rid of uh, at least one of those parking uh, bays and keep the trees, um, which, again, <laughs> you think, again, the Fifth Ward has uh, lowest canopy coverage and, and all of these other issues and, uh, uh, you know, one of the lower air qualities in, in the city. And so... Um, I would be even more enthusiastic to see that happen. Maybe it saves you all some money, so it could be a win-win for everyone. Uh, but if you're adding those additional carports uh, or parking, uh, that additional parking infrastructure to please us, at least from my standpoint and what I'm hearing from Councilman Ravel, uh, that uh, is not something we need or really want to see from you. Thank you. In the design of the building, we took into account some things, some of the things that you mentioned. The design includes uh, parking spaces for bicycles, and the design also includes charging spaces for electric cars, and which will reduce, we believe, will reduce uh, emission. And uh, what we've also done is to, in, in working with the architect and taking feedback from the community member, is to ensure that we we leave as many of those three canopies there as possible for the same reason that you, you raise, uh, Alderman uh, Reed that the Fifth Ward is not always enjoy the same level of, of tree presence as the rest of the city. So we, we struggle with trying to make sure we preserve as much of that as possible. And our plan is also to encourage our, our educators to, where possible, take public transportation, bike to school, and avoid driving if at all possible. So then I'm hearing that you, you, you we, said we, as much as possible. So I think it's possible to remove that carport, and so maybe we'll, we'll see that done. We, we would happily like that condition removed if, if that's 
pleases the council for sure. I would uh, make a motion to remove uh, the condition of, if that's a condition, of two carports and just move it down to one. Okay. You would that be an amendment to I, this? I am, yes. If that, I'm, yeah, I'm not exactly sure if it's amendment. I just heard here that it was a condition, and if it needs to be removed, I am moving to do such. Thank you, Elizabeth. Good evening, um, Liz Williams, for the record. So, um, if you would like to, condition 13, proposed staff condition 13, um, is to add a pickup and drop up on the southern portion of Ashland. Um, to mirror the one that is north um, on Ashland. If, if you'd like to make that amendment motion, that would be the appropriate condition to remove. Okay, I, I move to remove staff condition number 13 relating to the carports. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. And Ms. To preserve and, and, the trees. And to ensure that the goal, yeah, don't tear down the trees after. <laughs> Council Member Harris. We're, we're voting on the amendment. On the amendment, okay. Yes, Aye. the amendment. Aye. Council Member Reed. Aye. Council Member Revell. Aye. Council Member Kelly. Aye. Council Member Newsma. Aye. Council Member Wynn. Aye. Six to zero. All right, the amendment passes. Very good. Um, Council Member Newsma. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Councilmember Reed, for bringing up CARP. Uh, if I could ask about the uh, the design of the building and uh, energy efficiency, renewable energy measures, and its compliance with the city's CARP uh, goals, understanding that in this case it's not the city's building code that you're beholden to. Th thank you, Councilmember. Um, the intent from the district is to attain a lead silver or gold which would be in keeping with many of the CARP objectives of the city of Evanston. And is, is this, I guess this might be a question for legal, it, would it be appropriate to have, to, to codify that intent as a condition of special use? Um, can you repeat the question? So just so everyone knows what we're talking about, school districts don't have to get a building permit from the city you get your building permit from the yeah, yeah. regional ROE district yes. of yeah. re regional superintendent. So it's not the city's building code that applies. If it did, you would be compelled to make the building CARP compliant, lead silver or whatever. Um, that's not the case here. So my question for legal is would it be uh, legal and appropriate to make CARP compliance or lead silver uh, some kind of um, environmental compliance a condition of special use no I think that's exclusively within the whatever the acronym is for the regional school regional yeah. office of education ROE. Yeah. you could um, suggest a condition that they strongly encourage that they explore or seek um, a certain level of lead um, but I don't you know I think that that's about the extent that I would recommend at this point okay if that's the, as strong as we can make it, I will make that motion to add an additional requirement uh, that the city is requesting uh, the district to do everything they can to make this building, uh, to lower this building's carbon footprint. We have no problem with that. That is actually a goal. Thank you. Second. So uh, maybe between now and council, we can just come up with some words. Are you going to amend it at council then? Does that make sense? I'm happy to do sure. that. Sure, whatever. Okay. Um, council member Reed? Ravel. Council member oh, Ravel, sorry. Well, in the same vein, um, I'd also like us to be alluding to the bird friendly ordinance and the, our green building code. So, kind of wrap it all together. Thanks. Okay, so at council, you'll. So Liz can get some language. Great, thank, thank you. you. Uh, Council Member Reed. Yes. Um, with that in mind, uh, what Council Member Newsom put forward to, to meet our lead and what Council Member Ravel just mentioned to meet our bird friendly, um, I heard you say that it is your intention to meet those standards or you would like to meet those standards? We are committed to meeting the uh, 
the silver or gold uh, lead certification. So that's already your what you're going to. Yes. Do. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well then, I, I was I was going to ask if you're already going to do it, so it's safe for me yeah, to say this. Yeah, my, my thought was that if the city, you know, needs to, if this is a public building. Uh, if if we needed to put up uh, some funds, I don't know exactly how much this would cost. Uh, you know, it might be appropriate for you to ask us um, to to chip in. But you're already doing it, so good. Any further discussion? I just I had one question. If someone could walk through a little bit the community participation involvement and the decision, like. Were there various schematics presented and I mean how did this, I mean just because we heard from community this evening and I would just like to get a better understanding on the input from community and the, the number of meetings held with regard to the structure itself, the size of the school. Yeah, we have had numerous community engagement meetings um, going back to last year. I, I believe the count, correct five. me, five, five community meetings uh, have taken place in and around the Fifth Ward um, District um, to get feedback from the community as to uh, various aspects of the site development, the site, the building design, uh, site design. Um, th that has been our objective, the district's objective is to make sure that the neighborhood is fully aware of what's going on from des design decisions and so on. Uh, and I just also want to point out that the initial design, which Brian didn't talk about, was totally different from what we ended up in. And the reason why the current design looks very different is the incorporation of the feedback that we, we received over the five different committee engagement meetings. So we listened to, to suggestions from the committee and the architect incorporated in the design, the final design that you see now. Thank you. Could you use a few examples of how you modified it according to community input? Sure, happy to. The, the site development, there were, I think we had 19 different options of how the building could be placed on the site uh, and narrowed it down to, I think, six at one time. And then from that uh, feedback we received uh, with the site design, we, we ended up settling in on the, the option you see in front of you with the building pushed towards Simpson and Ashland to really to try to preserve as much open green space as possible. Uh, that was one of the primary objectives we heard from the from the community. Uh, that was a high high um, importance to them. So that really drove our decision making on pushing the building closer to the edge of the property. Um, and, and then the other various things uh, have come about with the uh, use of materials. Uh, a lot has come about from the sustainability components. We've been talking quite, quite frequently with various individuals from the, from the community about um, the, the, the district's commitment to sustainability. Uh, that has gone uh, very well understood that there is a, a, a primary objective to that. I mean, specifically, I also want to point to the height. Initially, we had a four-story building design, and the feedback from the community led us to, to reduce that to three stories. And one big pain point where we got uh, feedback was also the selection of the, uh, the playing field. Initially, we talked about using uh, tough, and the community was very adamant that it would like natural grass. And so we took that into consideration and changed the design. And I think also, I know Brian mentioned this, the initial design showed more brick. And what we've done is we've, we've made it so that light comes through more. So it's not as much, uh, you know, it's more. More fenestration or glazing windows, as Raphael was alluding to. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. appreciate you walking us through that. Okay. And any, no further discussion. All right. With that, um, Ms. Flax. Councilmember Harakaras? Aye. Councilmember Reed? Aye. Councilmember Ravel? Aye. Councilmember Kelly? Aye. Councilmember Newsma? Aye. And Councilmember Wynn? Aye. Six to zero. Six zero. That passes. Okay. And I think that um, wraps up our meeting for this evening. Um, City Council to begin at 720. Is that too soon? Yes. Okay. City Council will begin at 720. Thank you.